what's been absolutely blowing up across social media, across normal media, across just about everything online is this paper, the first room temperature ambient pressure superconductor. That sounds big. It sounds big and indeed the final line, they don't pull any punches, the final line of the entire paper. We believe that our new development will be a brand new historical event that opens a new era for humankind. Amazing, right? Absolutely amazing. Except it's um, really been shot down. That, this was published on the 22nd of July, 2023. Uh, a couple of weeks later, it's been absolutely pilloried online, shot down from a number of different angles. And I could go through the science, but there's so many videos out there that cut through the science. I, I guess the, the briefest and the, the, the neatest and pithiest deconstruction of the science is Sabina Hossenfelder's. Uh, she goes through it in about five minutes and really cuts it to pieces. And I'll talk a little bit about the science, but what I really want to get across is this, this is not how to do science. This is really frustrating for the rest of us. You know, if you think you get a result, you get a groundbreaking result like this. I mean, if we had room temperature superconductors, are they going to help with certain things? Yes. Are they really going to revolutionize humanity? Perhaps not. Will they give us more efficient power um, transfer? Will they give us more efficient uh, levitating trains? Yes, all that types of things. But are they absolutely going to rewrite the rules? Possibly, possibly not. So the, the paper claims that they have discovered a superconductor that works not just at room temperature, but at temperatures all the way up to about 120 degrees C which is frankly quite amazing because we've known about superconductivity for about a century now. Um, and initially, up until about the 80s, we had low temperature superconductors where the, the, what's called the critical temperature, the temperature at which the superconductivity just gives out and we're, we're back to a normal uh, metal, normal um, type of electrical conduction, uh, off the order of a few Kelvin, a few degrees above absolute zero to a few tens of Kelvin maybe. Then there was a huge amount of excitement in the 80s with the discovery of what are called high temperature superconductors. Now that's a bit of a misnomer because high temperature to a physicist is not high temperature to, to everybody else in that these were uh, superconductors that would work at liquid nitrogen temperatures. And all those demonstrations you've seen of um, magnets and stuff levita or superconductors levitating above magnets and little trains going round, etc. all of that and you see the, the, um, the condensation due to the liquid nitrogen in the background of sort of steaming off, as it were. That's, those are all high temperature superconductors. And there's been a drive, obviously, can we push this further? Can we keep going? Both for the, the, the pure intellectual excitement of it all, but also, of course, well, you know, there were, would be in pretty important um, applications because a superconductor implies dissipationless implies a current flowing with no energy losses, which is really quite amazing. And it's really complicated, really fascinating phys physics. And it involves, for the conventional superconductors, it involves how the electrons couple to how the crystal is wobbling and how they pair up into these things called Cooper pairs. And then for the high temperature superconductors, it took a long, long time. It was really only last year where there's been good definitive evidence for a particular mechanism of pairing up those electrons in high temperature superconductors um, has really got, got a lot of supporting evidence uh, due to uh, work of a group led by a guy called Seamus Davis, a fellow Irishman. So this paper, what, what, were they, what magic bullet did they claim they'd found? They basically argue that effectively they stumbled upon this fortuitously, this mixture of um, a lead-containing compound and a copper-containing compound. They mix them together and as if by magic, somehow superconductivity uh, appears. And they have got these very strong statements, as you've just heard, in terms of this is going to change the world. We have discovered, even the title of the paper, not the way to do science. Even I get emails sometimes from people saying they've had some great invention or a great discovery, and I take them with a, with a grain of salt. But this one has been widely reported, everyone's been talking about it, so there must be some reason this is getting more credence. It's interesting, it's intriguing, because when you look at that, there was this paper and then there was a follow-up paper which was uploaded exactly the same day. And I don't understand why it's getting credence. There were some 
you know, there was obviously a lot of um, people out there who were quite skeptical, but I don't know why the kickback wasn't stronger because this, this is not the way to present data. So this is the resistivity as a function of temperature. Is, right? that, is that your addition there, the W? Uh, yeah, the, the WTF is my addition. That's not in the original paper. <laughs> um, I can give you a censored redacted version if you want, pretty. <laughs> but so here, First of all, if you've got a superconductor, you hit that critical temperature and the resistivity drops and it stays flat. That's not what's happening here. It, you can see, even on this diagram, it, it drops. Okay, there's a jump, but there are many other reasons you can have a jump in conductivity. And then it sort of tails off. So they are claiming their superconductivity just on the basis of this. Moreover, and even more perplexing, is this resisti resistivity scale, so resistivity is just the resistance per sort of unit cross-sectional area per unit length. That's all it is. So it's, it's the resistance taking into account the dimensions of the sample effectively. And it's 10 to the minus 2 ohm centimeter. I can pick up a first year textbook. This is our first year physics textbook. Let's look up what we'd expect for normal metal. What type of resistivities? Okay, it's ohm meter, so we have to add, uh, instead of ohm centimeter, we have to take off a factor of 10 to the minus 2 here. So we've got something like 2.8 by 10 to the minus 6. So even, so, and on this scale, this is 10 to the minus 2. You can see, this is 1 by 10 to the minus 2, 2 by 10 to the minus 2. If you really want to show that you've got something which has got the resist, the resistivity has dropped as close to zero as you can measure. You do not present it like this. You zoom in on this area and you show, well, actually, this is far below the type of resistivity we expect from metal. So just that graph alone, I can point to many other things and maybe we'll do a little bit of that. But I just don't get it. And there were even people saying that the interesting thing, there was a, a very widely um, publicized or very widely shared essentially viral tweet, which was, why are scientists not getting more excited about this? And the problem is your training as a scientist is not to get excited, particularly if you discover something in the lab. Your first job is to go, it's wrong. Where is it wrong? Where have I effed up? How do I fix this? Then you go back and you check again. And then what you don't do is put this on the web saying that this is this brand new um, dawn for, for humanity. And without I would argue, let's share this in terms of the peer review process. Let's get some feedback on this. I would say it's really brave slash arrogant to just put it out there and claim, make these claims on the basis of this type of evidence. Who are these people, though? Because anyone can say, I'm changing humanity. Was this some reputable group at Cambridge? Like, surely... It's a Korean group with very, very little, if any, background in superconductivity, which again is why are people jumping all over this? And what frustrates me is, is really, we've discussed this many times before, Billy, and we're both very keen in sort of opening up the scientific process and letting people in. But the problem is when, when claims like this are made and then they're shot down, we have this trickle effect where the credibility of science keeps getting eroded. And it's very frustrating. I'm all for letting the cameras in, but let's do the science properly. So this hasn't been peer reviewed and published in a journal? No, absolutely not. It's just on the archive, which is what's called a preprint server, where it's a good thing to upload stuff to the archive. That's before publication. We've discussed the issues with peer review before. Some really dodgy papers get through peer review. I'm not suggesting, but with this, you know, it doesn't take a lot of peer review, and I'm not an expert in superconductivity. I do condensed matter physics. We play with big magnets, et cetera, et cetera, but I'm certainly not an expert. But even to those who aren't expert in the field, you look at this and you go, well, if this was an undergraduate experiment, and undergraduates often measure um, superconductivity in a range of different samples as projects, you'd go, well, no, this clearly is wrong. Zoom in here, have a bit more evidence. Instead of having just one point in this transition, maybe measure a few more points, that type of thing. So it just looks and feels sloppy. So what's the point of the archive then if people can't put their preliminary results on there before they get published in journals? Good point. That's a really good point. So I'm sort of, it's a little bit of a dilemma for me. Um, should the archive be there? Absolutely. I've argued, argued strongly in favour of the archive before. The problem is one of the downsides of the archive, particularly in this social media enabled age, 
is that something like this can go on which has had absolutely no quality control. And it can just, apart from the, 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 the very small level of moderation associated with putting a, a, a paper in the archive. And if you're getting lots of papers to moderate, you're getting lots of papers to consider, you can't give every particular paper a great deal of attention. So things can slip through the net. But the problem is when it blows up like it did, where, as I say, that tweeted 30 million views every newspaper outlet, every media outlet, every social media outlet has jumped on this saying this is the future of humanity. The problem is we need some level of quality control. What should they have done? Oh, so they should have repeated this measurement with a wide range of different samples. They should ensure that if they want to convince people that basically until this um, resistivity drops and stays dropped, you don't go ahead and say this is a room temperature superconductor. You just don't, because that's the key piece of evidence is for that resistivity to drop and stay flat. It, oh, yeah. it tails off the whole way down and then eventually, at whatever this is, close to room temperature, is zero. But the problem is zero on this scale means nothing because this could be 10 to the minus 6, very easily 10 to the minus 6, which is just the same as the resistivity here. The other aspect of it is they have the sort of other part of the, um, or the smoking gun, as it were, in terms of superconductivity, is this thing called the Meissner effect, where you have your superconductor um, uh, will uh, essentially reject a magnetic field, and so you can have a superconductor and a magnet above it, and the magnet will, will levitate. But this is, is levitation, has just fallen off, fantastic. This is just a piece of bog standard graphite, carbon. We're going to put it on top of magnets which are arranged so we've got a nice little minimum in the magnetic field in the center here. We're going to drop it down. That's levitating. That's just diamagnetism. That's, that's, that's nothing to do with superconductivity. It's just the fact that some materials, and graphite turns out to be really um, uh, good at doing this, reject uh, a magnetic field, repel a magnetic field. Other materials, which are called paramagnetics, are attracted to a magnetic field, and then we have ferromagnets when you know that you've got, um, like your, your normal fridge magnet. But this is just routine diamagnetism at room temperature. So one of the other pieces of evidence, as it were, is that they've got this rather dodgy um, lump of superconductor, um, which they, they claim is, is levitating uh, above a magnet and it's sort of halfway down and halfway up. Now, there are a couple of things that could explain that without superconductivity. First of all, it could be strong diamagnetism, or indeed, it could be ferromagnetism, where you've got sort of North Pole here, South Pole here, you're above a magnet, North Pole is attracting to South Pole, but South Poles are, are repelling, so it does that. And indeed, a couple of, of groups have, have, have claimed that. Where does it stand now? Has it been, would you say this has been debunked? Yeah. Or it's the yeah, I, I would say it's been sorry, sorry to put in, but yeah, I would say it's been wholly debunked, and um, which is, in that sense, is science working? It's you know it has worked uh, within two weeks or whatever, three weeks, two and a bit weeks of it being uploaded. It's been debunked, I would say, thoroughly. But the problem is, is the sort of remnant of it that exists out there in the social media, and the way it's raised expectations, and then. In this age of bloody misinformation where scientists are, you know, criticised and not trusted, to have stuff going out there like this, which claims so much, and it to be so sloppy, it's, it's very frustrating. There's no chance they, they've got this right and you're going to look silly in a year. If they've got it right, I'm very happy to eat humble pie. You can bring it in and I'll eat my underpants, I'll eat your <laughs> underpants, whatever. <laughs> I'll eat their underpants. Um, you could be eating a lot of underpants. <laughs> I could. I, I'm very, very happy to be um, proven wrong, but I very much doubt it. Have you ever published something that's been wrong yep. later? Yeah, thank you. Oh, what a great question. Yeah, so we had to retract the paper. And you don't want to retract a paper. Um, it's, it's embarrassing, it's frustrating, and it was my fault. I cocked up a calibration. We used, we've talked about this before. We use these teensy tiny tuning forks uh, to measure interatomic forces, but we have to calibrate the response of those tuning forks, i.e. know if we put a certain voltage in, how much the, the tuning fork is moving. And I screwed it up. And I screwed it up by about 50%, not a small amount, which meant that we basically had to pull a paper. It's out there, you can find it. So there's a pub pier, which is 
post-publication peer review thing, and there's there's um, the retraction notice as well. It's very frustrating um, and very embarrassing, but that's the way you have to do it. If, if you see something wrong, you have to, 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 to retract it. Indeed, the president of Stanford has um, ha had to resign recently for exactly that reason, that there were papers that were out there to his knowledge were wrong and he didn't retract them. And this is the president of Stanford. So we have to keep science clean. We have to keep it as close to the truth as possible. So, and the other thing that worries me in some other fields, mistakes like that and misinterpretations of data aren't treated the same. So a while back, there was this furore at um, CERN, um, all this excitement about a sort of new peak in the data. Well, there were 400, 500 publications on this. It was a noise, it was a statistical blip. And I would say that you retract those papers. In that particular field, however, they would claim, well, if it's moved theory forward, even if it's wrong, what's the problem? And I would say as an experimental condensed matter physicist, you need this, it's absolutely essential to have this feedback loop between experiment and theory. And if that's broken, science is broken. Again. So you can see tips resonating, tuning forks resonating. We bring it in on top of an atom. Hopefully people who you would think could do a very good job at um, looking through your paper, criticizing it, critiquing it, 